Okay, good morning. So we're going to continue reading from Bhikkhu Tanisro's book, newest book along the way. Um, and this is his common sort of commentary on the Noble Eightfold Path. So we're going to read chapter two today. We've already read chapter three, which is how to be a good student. <laughs> and then chapter one, which is how to identify a good teacher. And today is about Dhamma. And he titled it, Dhamma is what Dhamma does. And he subtitled it, The Buddha as Strategist. You may know the story. The Buddha was once staying in the Samsapa forest with a group of monks. He picked up a few samsapa leaves, which are like miniature aspen leaves, and asked the monks which was greater, the number of leaves in his hand or the number of leaves in the forest. The, remon the monks replied that, of course, there were far more leaves in the forest than in his hand. The Buddha went on to say that in the same way, the things he had known through direct knowledge but had not taught were like the leaves in the forest. The things he had taught based on his direct knowledge were like the leaves in his hand. Why had he taught so little? Because in his words, the things he had not taught were not connected with the goal, do not relate to the rudiments of the holy life and do not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to, dis to cessation, to stilling, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening to unbinding. And what had he taught? The Four Noble Truths. This is stress, and Bhikkhu Tanisro's way of uh, translating the word dukkha, which often is translated as suffering, he translates it as stress. So this is stress. This is the origination of stress. This is the cessation of stress. And this is the practice leading to the cessation of stress. And why had he taught that? Because these truths were connected with the goal, did relate to the rudiments of the holy life, and did lead to <clears throat> disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, stilling, direct knowledge, self-awakening, unbinding. Synonyms for Nibbana. The incident, this incident makes an important statement about how to read and understand the Buddha's Dhamma. He wasn't interested in stating truths simply because they were true. He taught truths that serve a purpose. When his listeners acted on those truths, those actions would have a desired impact on their minds. It's good to take a close look at how he expresses the nature of that impact. He starts by using the word goal. In Pali, the word is atta, which means not only goal, but also meaning, benefit, purpose, profit. The word rarely appears in Western discussions of the Dhamma, but in Asia, it's frequently paired with the word Dhamma. Useful truths are said to be both atta and Dhamma. In fact, the whole point of the Dhamma is that it has an atta. The Four Noble Truths are a special kind of Dhamma in that they cover everything needed to serve that atta, beginning with the rudiments of the holy life. This is a shorthand reference to the virtues of the five precepts, as well as the atta itself, the attainment of total unbinding, an unconditioned dimension that's, that's the highest possible happiness. In some cases, the atta of a Dhamma teaching is its meaning as expressed in words that are easier to understand. But in the Buddha's remarks in the Samsapa forest, the word atta obviously means something more than words, a direct experience of the goal, the reality of the freedom and liberation that the teaching is supposed to lead to. These two aspects of atta are closely related. We could even say that you don't fully know the meaning of the words of the Dhamma until you've directly experienced the goal to which they point 
and which is their whole purpose for being. The Buddha was wise in emphasizing this purposeful aspect of the Dhamma because the mind, as he accurately saw, is purposeful as well. It doesn't simply gaze at views about the truth in rapt admiration. In its quest to eliminate pain or suffering, it constructs views about the truth and acts on them to serve its aims. To evaluate the worth of the truth, you have to look into the mind state that inspires you to assemble it, the purposes it inspires you to aim at, and the actions that inspires you to take. This was precisely the Buddha's approach. He saw that if you adopt a particular view or line of questioning, it would bend the mind in the direction of the mind state that created it. If you acted on the view, those actions would have a further impact on the mind, leading to experiences of pleasure or pain, depending on whether those actions were skillful or not. This is why the Buddha regarded views about truth as a type of kama or action. In turn, he viewed those actions as part of a causal process judging them by where the process ultimately led. If they led to an inferior goal, he would reject them. As for the views he himself taught, he chose them because they would inspire the kind of actions that would lead to total freedom from suffering. This active role of the Dhamma is explicitly clear in the case of the Four Noble Truths. Each truth carries a duty it's a guide to action. You should comprehend stress, know it. You should abandon its orig origination or cause within the mind. You should realize its cessation all by developing the path to its cessation. So abandon, so, sorry, know or comprehend, abandon, realize and develop. Those are our four duties with the Four Noble Truths. He simply pointed out that if you want to put an end to suffering and stress, this is what you have to do. At the same time, it's worth noting not only that the Four Noble Truths contain the Fourth Noble Truth, which is a guide to action, but also that they themselves are contained in the Fourth Truth, the factor of right view and the Noble Eightfold Path. As a container for that path, the four truths explain why the path is the beneficial one to follow. As a factor in the path, they show that views are actions to be adopted both because they're true and because they act as a guide to beneficial action in the form of the other factors of the path, leading to a goal that lies beyond them. This is why when the Buddha gave metaphors for the path, including right view, he chose modes of transport like rafts and chariots, means to a destination. When you reach the destination, the mode of transport can be set aside. In fact, he made it a general rule. For him to say something, it had to be not only true, but also beneficial in leading to skillful action. Further, he had to be sensitive to his audience knowing when to say beneficial truths that were pleasing and when to say beneficial truths that were not. He gave the analogy of a baby child with a sharp object in its mouth. Sometimes you have to be willing to draw blood if that's what's required to get the object out before the child swallows it and suffers greater harm. So the Buddha had to be strategic in how he taught the Dhamma. Unlike other teachers of his time, he didn't have a canned dhamma that he rattled off to all listeners. This may be why his followers presented their memory of his teaching in the form of dialogues, to show how the Buddha presented different aspects of the dhamma to different listeners, in line with the situation and their specific needs. Sometimes truths that pleased them, sometimes truths that didn't, but always truths that were beneficial. It's important to note though, that in the Buddha's analysis of the possible varieties of speech, the idea of a falsehood could, could be, the idea that a falsehood could be beneficial was never even entertained as a possibility. The concept of 
useful fictions was, as far as he was concerned, of the question. A strategic distinction. The Buddha's strategic approach to teaching is also shown by the distinction he made between teachings whose atta had to be drawn out into further explanations and those whose atta was already drawn out and should not be drawn out any further. This distinction was so important that he said you were slandering him if you got it mixed up, trying to infer a further meaning of a teaching whose, whose meaning was already drawn out or claiming that there was no need for any further interpretation of a teaching that actually needed it. Unfortunately, he didn't give examples for these two categories of teaching, but when we remember that the Dhamma is meant as a guide to action, one way of interpreting the distinction seems clear, and it's supported by watching the Buddha in action as he teaches. Some, teaching <clears throat> Some teachings don't give clear instructions for action. Instead, they describe the reality of the situation. In this case, the meaning has to be drawn out. What are the practical implications of that situation? An example would be the Buddhist description of how the universe evolves, which portrays events in far distant reaches of the past and the future without giving explicit instructions as to how you should act. At the very end of the descriptions though, the Buddha himself draws out the meaning. The changes in the universe come from the actions of living beings. So if you want to avoid the miseries that can be found in the universe, take care to act skillfully. As for teachings whose meaning shouldn't be drawn out any further, Two prime examples are the Buddha's teachings on self and not self. Nowhere in the canon does the Buddha say either that there is a self or that there is no self. Questions of who am I, do I exist, do I not exist, he says, are not worthy of attention. In fact, he goes on to say that views that attempt to answer these questions, such as I have a self or I have no self, are a fetter bound by which you're not freed from suffering and stress. So to stay on the path, you should try to avoid paying attention to such questions. And it's not the case that they'll get answered at awakening. As Samyutta Nikaya 1220 points out, once you've attained even the first level of awakening, these questions no longer hold any meaning or interest for you. Still, for the purpose of arriving at awakening, the Buddha does analyze how the assumption of self comes about, pointing out how some assumptions of self are not skillful, while other assumptions of self in certain circumstances are. You can make use of the things that you identify as you or yours, such as perceptions and thought fabrications, as means to the goal. In addition, assumptions that you have to depend on yourself, that you're capable of the practice and that you will benefit from it all play a necessary role in pursuing the path. The Buddha called this approach using the self as a governing principle. So even though he refuses to say that there is a self, he makes use of, quote, self <laughs> as a strategy on the path. At the same time, he points out how not-self is a useful perception at many stages of the path, and particularly in the last ones, as a tool for comprehending stress and abandoning its cause. Because ideas of self contain an element of clinging, which the first noble truth equates with suffering, the perception of not-self is a useful tool for bringing that clinging to an end. This perception is even useful at a very high level of the practice for overcoming any attachment to the path or the goal so that the mind freed from all attachments, including any attachment to the perception, not self, can reach liberation. So here again, even though the Buddha refuses to say that there is no self, he uses not self as a Dhamma teaching leading to a higher atta. 
This point is illustrated more clearly in Majima Nikaya 109. There, a monk <clears throat> listening to the Buddha, teaching that the five aggregates of form, feeling, perception, fabrications, this is what we do with our mind, and consciousness are not self, draws out what he thinks is a logical implication of the teaching. So, form is not self. Feeling is not self. Perception is not self. Fabrications are not self. Consciousness is not self. Then what self will be touched by the actions done by what is not self? In other words, the monk reasons that because the aggregates are all not self, there must be no self, so no actions will be able to touch, i.e. give karmic results to what is not self. <clears throat> <clears throat> This line of reasoning would serve a very unskillful atta, giving license to all kinds of unskillful behavior. That's why the Buddha, on reading the monk's mind, rebukes him sharply, saying that he's senseless, immersed in ignorance, and overcome with craving. The Buddha then goes on to show the proper strategic use of the teaching on not-self, questioning the other monks listening to the talk about their assumptions of self around the aggregates so that they'll perceive the aggregates as not self, to develop dispassion for them and to gain release. The add to both of the perception of not self and of the Dhamma as a whole. So even though the Buddha found useful roles at certain times in the path, both for the assumption of a self and for the perception of not self, those teaching strategies have their meaning fully drawn out. In neither case should you infer from them that there is or is not a self. For those views, as the Buddha pointed out, would induce actions leading away from the goal. Tests for the true Dhamma. The relationship between the Dhamma and its Atta is so direct that the Buddha made it a criterion for testing what was true Dhamma and what was not. If you followed the Dhamma teaching and it led you to the Atta he taught, an experience of unbinding, then you knew it was the genuine article. He framed this test in different terms, from the most basic to the most refined, depending on his audience. For the Kalamas, a group of skeptical lay people, he outlined a very basic test. If, when you act on a teaching, it leads to long-term welfare and happiness, then you should keep following that teaching. For his stepmother, Mahapapajati Gotami, he have framed a more extensive test. True Dhamma can be recognized by what it leads to in three areas. In terms of the ultimate goal, it should lead to dispassion and being unfettered. In terms of the means to that goal, to shedding contentment and arouse persistence, in terms of a relationship it fosters towards others, it should lead to modesty, reclusiveness, and being unburdensome. I'll read that again. So for his stepmother, he framed a more extensive test. True Dhamma can be recognized by what it leads to in three different areas. So in the first area, the, the ultimate goal, it should lead to dispassion and being unfettered. So all the hindrances are gone. In terms of the means to that goal, this is the second area, it should lead to shedding contentment and aroused persistence. And in terms of re the relationship it fosters towards others, it should lead to modesty, reclusiveness, and being unburdensome. For Venerable Upali, one of the foremost monk's students, the Buddha formulated a test echoing his comments to the monks in the Samsapa forest. True Dhamma, when put into practice, leads to utter disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to stilling, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, to unbinding. So he's talking about Nibbana. The Buddha saw the need for this sort of test in his own lifetime, as there are reported instances of monks distorting the teaching even to his face. He dealt with them severely to show how seriously he meant for his Dhamma not to be changed. 
He also stated that those who attributed sayings to him that he didn't say or denied his saying things that he actually did say were slandering him. He also foresaw that the tendency to distort the Dhamma would increase after his passing, saying that the true Dhamma would disappear in 500 years. For those of us living more than 2,500 years after his passing, it's a forecast that brings us up short. Is there no true Dhamma left anymore? But Samyutta Nikaya 16, 13 gives us an analogy to explain what he meant. The true Dhamma disappears when counterfeit Dhamma appears in the same way that genuine money that genuine money disappears when counterfeit money begins to circulate in the market. In other words, genuine money is still there, but people begin to lose their confidence as to what's genuine and what's not. In the same way, true Dhamma can still exist, but it's surrounded by so much counterfeit Dhamma that even the concept of true Dhamma as opposed to false gets called into question. <clears throat> When counterfeit Dhamma actually came into circulation and what it taught is a matter of historical conjecture. A prime candidate is the teaching on the non-arising of phenomena, which appeared 500 years after the Buddha's passing and claims that nothing really arises or passes away and that everything is a timeless oneness. If this were true, then the Four Noble Truths would not be true for they speak of suffering arising and passing away. But again, whatever this is the teaching, what, sorry, but again, whether this is the teaching that the Buddha had in mind when he foresaw counterfeit Dhamma is just a matter of conjecture. What's undeniable though, is that the Buddha's definition of the disappearance of the true Dhamma describes a situation that prevails now with so many contradictory versions of the Dhamma at large in the world. Some people even laugh at the idea that any version of the Dhamma has any right to claim to be right and others wrong. They make a comparison with maps. Just as every map distorts reality so that no single map can claim to be totally accurate description of the truth, in the same way, every version of the Dhamma distorts reality, and so no version can qualify as exclusively right. But this is a misreading of the map analogy. Neither maps nor the Dhamma are meant to be contemplated in and of themselves. They serve a purpose, an atta, and their accuracy can be tested by seeing if they actually serve the purpose intended for them. The fact that a map distorts some aspect of reality is no problem as long as it provides an accurate as, as long as it provides accurate directions for arriving at the goal for which it was drawn. If you're drawing a treasure map, for instance, you'll have to leave out some information. In fact, if you clutter the map with too many extraneous details, it becomes confusing and counterproductive. All that matters is that the route to the treasure is portrayed clearly enough to be followed and that the route actually leads to the treasure. In the same way, the Dhamma is expressed in words and the nature of words is that they provide only a sketch of the reality they describe. But even then, they can still serve a good atta if the lines of the sketch act as a reliable guide to take you to that atta. Just as a map shouldn't be cluttered with extraneous information, the Buddha found it advisable to avoid most of the philosophical debates about the nature of the world and the self existent in his day, so that his Dhamma could focus on being accurate in the basics, what's needed to get to the treasure of unbinding. His word for Nibbana. We like to think that the contradictions among available Dhamma maps are immaterial, that they simply point out alternate routes to the same goal. But the fact of the matter is that they describe not only different routes, but also different locations for the treasure. They even describe the treasure in different terms. So they can't all be right, as we noted in the case of the Four Noble Truths and the teachings of non-arising phenomena, which means we have to choose among them. 
given that the Dhamma is not always pleasing, we can't let our likes and dislikes determine our choice. In fact, even when the Dhamma seems reasonable and fits in with what we already believe, that doesn't mean it's true. Our only hope of finding the true Dhamma is to test it, to choose a Dhamma that seems promising and put into practice to see where it leads. This test entails more than reading and reasoning about texts. It requires high levels of commitment and honesty and keen powers of observation of your own actions and their results. Character traits that the Buddha looked for in all his students. It's only through being true yourself that you can know the Dhamma is true. But then the Dhamma promises a lot of truth in return not just a theory about happiness, but a direct, unchanging experience of the highest happiness possible. This is its atta. The potential reality of that atta is what keeps the Dhamma a living tradition. Without that atta, it would be nothing more than a historical curiosity. Some theories about the mind and the world that far away people believed in the far distant past. It's because the Four Noble Truths are designed to be strategic, leading to a living experience that lies beyond words, that even now, after all these centuries, we still care about the Buddha's handful of leaves. So that was a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> but it just points to the, you know, the Buddha said, ehipasiko, which means come and see. So it's like, um, don't just believe me because I'm a famous person or I'm known as a, you know, a good teacher or whatever. Try out my teachings and then find out for yourself. You know, come and see, find out for yourself. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've personally received so much benefit from the following the teachings of the Buddha that you, you know it's true <laughs> just because you've got those We've got those benefits, but um, yeah, there's just, there are a lot of um, new agey things or all kinds of things out there, all kinds of teachings out there. So I think Bhikkhu Chinisro was just trying to uh, address that, make a comment on it so that we can be aware of that. Anyway, I'll open up for discussion. <laughs> Yeah, that was a thanks for reading that Sangamita. It was a yeah, it was a helpful read. Yeah, the thing I the, the start, stuff that started going through my mind when like you started talking about the true Dhamma and what you just said, like kind of um, gave a little bit more useful context about like new agey things. But like I, I think of a, I started thinking of immediately like how there can arise a lot of conflict in the views between schools. You know, like between like Tibetan and Zen and Theravada and, and things of this nature and how I know myself, how I can become like really susceptible to fixed views. I'm like, no, no, no. And I've heard others say this is like, no, this is the true Dhamma. I've heard that from every from every school that I've ever like dabbled with. They say like, this is the true Dhamma. <laughs> this is the true. <laughs> and so like, you know, I, I read a I read an essay by uh, Ajahn Sumedho a while ago. And anyway, just talking about the, you know, like the difference between, or like the, you know, comparing and contrasting like the Arahant path versus the Bodhisattva path. And anyways, like the end result was like, people have become fully liberated on both. So, I mean, just like all oh, fixed views. And that's, uh, that's something that's really served me well, because I can get real attached to the things I believe, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It can be confusing, but I, you know, we just have to take, take the teachings that seem reasonable to us, put them into practice, and then see if they work. Do they lead to wholesome results or unwholesome results? Yeah, the litmus test, totally. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it was the what you're saying there just reminds me he talked about the kalamas in this writing but that's one of the suttas um 
it's about the Kalamas and the Kalamas are this group of people. And, and when the Buddha came to their village, they said, who should we believe? You know, like every time a spiritual leader comes through, they're saying, my way is the way. And they said, we just don't know what to do. And so he basically said, does it, you know, lead to a wholesome result or an unwholesome result? That's use that as your test. Hi, Sangamita. Hi. Hi. Um, I remember going to a uh, Pentecostal church once, and um, I uh, someone turned to me uh, that was sitting beside me in the pew and said, have you been saved? <laughs> and I thought, oh, my, what does that mean? You know, I just wasn't used to that, uh, uh, yeah, form of uh, being addressed that way. Mm -hmm. Because you had to be saved to be belong and believe. And uh, yeah, so anyway, that was uh, sort of uh, a long, long time ago, but found that an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's what the, the, the Christian Pentecostals believed in. You had to be saved or you were going to hell. Right. And... Um, Anyway, I find, uh, anyway, this, yes, and the non-self, you know, it was that you were uh, reading about uh, in Sinicero's book. Um, well, uh, we have to just stop ourselves. Is that the best way? And uh, just when we're being, when I'm being negative that I should, uh, I just should say, that's not me or that's non-self. Yeah, I think, you know, we can use it skillfully, like, there is something here. I mean, if I touch myself, I feel, you know, I feel that happening. So we can't say there's nothing here. Um, but, the, you know, the big teaching of the Buddha is dependent origination, like causality. This is because that happened. Uh, uh -huh. this, this body of mine is here right now because of all kinds of conditions you know, starting from my mom and dad getting together and then the food I eat and and then how my brain works is all the, the, the teaching and learning and all my experiences. So everything, like there's nothing sort of fixed. It's all, you know, changing all the time and, and due to conditions. So the big thing is we want to wake up. We want to become mindful to mm -hmm. what we're thinking and doing and then say, is this skillful? Like, is it leading to me being happy or is this unskilled if it's leading to me, you know, suffering? And so yes. if, you're, if you're suffering, like you don't take this as some solid aspect of yourself. So you could say, well, I didn't ask for that thought or that feeling or whatever to arise in me. So it's not part of some solid self which is what's meant by, I guess you can say, is the meaning of self. So you can say, well, it's not self, but then like you, you, you don't just stop there. Then you have to say, okay, what new causes and conditions can I put into place to decrease the arising of that thing, that kind of thinking or that kind of feeling? Uh-huh. I see. Yeah, yeah. But it's helpful, you know, like if you're going through life saying, oh, I do this and I do that and it's bad and it's <laughs> good and I'm such a horrible person. Like, you know, it's just, <laughs> that's, yeah. you know, that can just weigh you down and, and it's not really helpful. So it's more helpful to say, um, oh, well, that's due there. That's there because of causes and conditions. You know, I, I don't agree with this because it's not moral or it's suffering or it's not helpful. Or uh -huh. what, what kind of causes and conditions can I put into place to shift that? <coughs> so, oh, that's helpful. Yeah. It's basically changing your mind. Yes. I mean, that's the whole point <laughs> of this training, right? The whole point of this training, going through the Noble Eightfold Path, is having that awareness seeing you know seeing clearly and this is why we um you know we talk about uh going into jhana states because that gives you the most 
clarity. You have such amazing clarity when you come out and then you can really see what it is that, you know, what those habit energies and tendencies are that are creating so much suffering. And then you can, you know, make changes to that. Yeah, so those are the beautiful emotions. So there's a lot of things that we want to let go of, but those, the four Brahma Viharas are the things we want to develop. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you, you definitely want to condition those. <laughs> For sure. Assessing whether something is wholesome. Oh, just to make sure I can grab the speaker. Yeah. Sangamitta, where were you? Where? Just, just hold one second, uh, Roddy. I, I just gave him the microphone here, so he, you can hear him. He was asking a question. Uh, I kind of lost some train of thought. And you have to put it. You have to put it right on your chin there. Sorry. I kind of lost some train. Um, okay, well, why don't you think about it sure. and Susan ask your question? <laughs> oh, it's not it's not important. Um, I was just curious as to where your retreat was in Quebec. Um, it was at Lac there, which was five minutes drive away from Saint Matthieu de Parc, which was a little bit away from Shawinigan, which is north of Trois Rivières, which is east of Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> wow it was remote it was a child it was held they rented a children's like summer camp oh oh thank you <laughs> okay have you got it back <laughs> not really <laughs> roddy's still thinking <laughs> uh, i'm trying to i'm trying to piece it like what you just talked about before was i'm, I'm trying to Get my brain around yeah basics here. yeah um and uh you know developing better conditions within the body and mind to live happier to have happier uh, things are more of like i suppose pure and developing those qualities we talked about mm -hmm. loving kindness compassion or um and you know i'm really i'm really leaning into like developing these conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not, you know, when we do have random things coming to our body or our mind, mm -hmm. and it's from past conditions that may, you know, not even make sense now, mm -hmm. they come back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we're supposed to like acknowledge them, that they're, that they're there. Mm -hmm. um, but then say, you know, these are from past conditions mm -hmm. and that's the then the then okay acknowledge it okay stop it and take some action to develop um, i don't know better a, be, a better view or mm -hmm. um yes take some action that leads us towards towards happiness towards peace towards you know letting the big thing is we're letting go of the hindrances because those are things that hinder us from ultimate happiness and we're developing the factors of awakening yeah so that's you know we have the four right efforts part of the noble eightfold path you know one of the steps is the four right efforts the second um the second step of the Noble Eightfold Path is right, is, sorry, no, it's uh, of the, um, um, just a minute, <laughs> uh, the factors of awakening. The second step is uh, discrimination. So that's your discriminating, is this wholesome or not wholesome? Mm. Yeah, right. So that's and then you're using the four right efforts to let go of the unwholesome and to, to develop the wholesome. Yeah.
Yeah. So if things, you know, we have things flickering through our mind all the time and we can't be attending to everything or we wouldn't get anything done in life or whatever, be able to live. So if it's just minor, you just let it, you just let it go. Uh, but if it's like, if it keeps grabbing you, grabbing you, <coughs> or whatever, then you have to sort of stop and pay attention and say, okay, what do I need to do to re you know, re remove this or replace this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have more than we can keep coming yeah, back. Keep coming back. Suffering yeah. Yeah. Process. Then you want to to do something to remove it or replace it. Yeah. And this time can be used for general Dhamma questions or questions about your practice. It doesn't have to be exactly on the topic of today. Well, then. <laughs> I've got one that's been burning inside of me, Sangamita. Okay. So, you know, speaking of dependent origination, I would like to, I would like to hear you um, flesh out a little bit the difference between craving and grasping. Yes. Um, that's not that one's not too hard. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> so you may be sitting here and think, oh, I'd like to have a cookie, mm -hmm. you know, so that would be your craving. But it'd be, oh, you know, like you, you could go, I don't really need one right now, or I'm not really hungry, or it's not healthy for me, you know, I want to lose some weight or something, and you let it go. So that's craving. And then it, you let it you can let it go or you can have the thought I want a cookie and then you you have trouble attending to what we're talking about here you know here the purpose is to be here and learn some dhamma but your mind's just now like do I have any cookies in the house do I have to get in the car and drive and buy some like <laughs> what kind of cookie do I want <laughs> that's the clinging part <laughs> nice that's beautiful thank you that makes perfect sense <laughs> Upadana, the uh, yeah, the Pali word is upadana, taking up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you speaking, um, Susan? You're you're muted. If you're, it looks like your mouth's moving, but you're muted. No, just talking to myself. You're just talking to yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, when uh, it, yeah, I, I'm just trying to be very um, mindful as I throughout the day or parts of the day. Yeah. What? How my mind? What? What I'm uh, mentally is going on? Yeah. My thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. We want to be mindful, and and after doing that retreat, you know, I have this little timer. It's called it's called the motivator. Oh. Um, and it by it vibrates. That's how I time our our sittings. But uh, you can put uh, variable. You can set it to sort of vibrate at variable times. And so one of the things I, you know, it was really emphasized in this retreat, and certainly I've, I've heard this before, but it was really emphasized in this retreat was the importance of staying with our, our meditation object, like our breath throughout the day. And, yeah. um, but, you know, you get caught up in things and you, you know, you forget about it. 
<laughs> and so I, what I want to do is learn how to relearn how to set this on uh, variable mode so my brain doesn't get used to it and just tune it out, but put it on variable mode. So every once in a while I get a little buzz, you know, whoop, my with my breath. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Or is that only, you use it only when you're uh, sitting in meditation? Or right now, that's what I do, but I, I want to sort uh, of expand its use, um, expand it, uh -huh. to sort of just keep it in my pocket or whatever, so that it acts as what Thich Nhat Hanh calls a mindfulness bell. Oh, I see. Yeah, you, you set it, you can set it for like five minutes and then it'll, it'll buzz, you know, either at one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, or five minutes, like on a variable thing, or you can set it for 30 minutes and then it'll, It'll buzz any time, um, you know, variable uh, intervals, uh, you know, up to 30 minutes or whatever, like whatever you set it to when you put it on variable. Interesting. Thank you. So, yeah. I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, so getting reminded to be with your breath. Mm -hmm. That's the practice. So sometimes I get pretty immersed in things that I really love. Mm -hmm. That's like really what takes my attention. For example, like if I'm like coaching, mm -hmm. working, mm -hmm. I just like time two hours just yeah. to look like this. Yeah. So even in that scenario, should I be bringing myself to my breath or should I let that kind of flow? Um, certainly if you're wanting to develop jhanas and if it's not interfering, you know, if you're able to sort of gently have that awareness of breathing in the background and be able to focus on your coaching, um, then it would be it would be extremely helpful for for John to practice. Um, but if it's you know if it's too much to do, like it may be too much to do, because it it may be that you only can do that if it's you know, you're sweeping the floor or walking somewhere or, you know, not doing something really, really complex, mm -hmm. like, like coaching. I find every now and again, it just kind of, you just kind of come back to it. Like yeah. It's like, a, you're like, you're so immersed and you mm -hmm. kind of like, I don't know what you would describe it, but you like become aware. Yeah, you wake up. I call it waking wake up. up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and usually in that scenario, I wake up and I'm like, this is amazing. And then I, you know, yeah. kind of, yeah. Go back in, but I, I'm not like setting timers. That just yeah. happens. Maybe. Yeah. Or maybe it doesn't. Yeah. 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 It's like when we're doing our, even when we're doing our sitting practice, we're with our breath, we're with our breath, and then our mind goes off in some thinking thing, and we're unaware. We're just immersed in it. And then we, quote, wake up like, oh, I'm supposed to be doing my meditation practice, and I'm thinking about lunch or something. <laughs> and then we bring ourselves back. Yeah. So that's, yeah present so this is trying to help keep us present so you're just going to have to experiment I mean um, to see if that's possible you know to do the two together otherwise you may have to just do it when you're you know because in the retreat we were instructed to do our activities whether it was eating or walking somewhere or doing a chore um, or getting ready for bed or whatever to do it at a speed like slow it down so that we could focus you know on our breath um you know we could as long we could go as fast as we wanted as long as we were still aware of that but we might have to slow it down in order to do the two things but when we're involved in our work in, you know in daily life we can't be we slowing down to a snail's pace. And is that yeah. simply just so we're continually developing the ability to focus on the breath? Yeah, I think. To focus. Yeah, to yeah, it's just it's practice. It's practice. So that's why Jonathan's easier to have it. Yeah, really because you you've, you've been practicing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're um, just five minutes too, so we can 
and I think we're on December 2nd, so first of the month. <laughs> we'll, we'll end with our um, reflection on metta, unconditional love. May you be well. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be loving. May you be calm. May you be safe. May no problems come to you. May no difficulties come to you. May no harm come to you. May you meet with spiritual success. May you have the patience, the clarity, the determination, the strength. the wisdom to meet and overcome the inevitable problems in life, to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties in life, to meet and overcome the inevitable frustrations in life, and to meet and overcome the inevitable failures in life. May the whole of your hearts be filled with loving friendliness. May every cell of your bodies be filled with loving friendliness. May every level of your consciousness be purified by loving friendliness. May you build a healthy, happy aura of loving friendliness all around you, through which no evil thought, word, or intention, or any form of harm may penetrate. And may you be protected. May the merit of our practice be shared with all sentient beings, named and unnamed. Please, Blair. Tracy's brother, Brad. May all beings be well and happy. Thank you, everyone. So one more week. Maybe we'll continue reading from Bhikkhu Tinisro's book, and then Aya Ahimsa will be here. So we pick her up on December 11th, and depending on how late her plane gets in, <laughs> we'll come back to Canmore that night or the next morning. So she'll be here for that Tuesday and then that Friday. So we're going to do a meet and greet, I think, for the first Tuesday and Friday. We won't have a, a Dhamma teaching. We'll just introduce ourselves to her and she can introduce herself to us. I think that'll be a nice way to start it. The 11th. Yeah. Okay. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>